Okay, here we go. Good evening, everybody. Uh, this is Matthew Daughter, Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society's Executive Director, and I'd like to welcome you to this evening's speaker series with Jack Laws. Um, I'm sure most of you have used Zoom many times before. Uh, there's really nothing that you need to know at this point, but except one thing. Uh, we'll be taking questions toward the end, and uh, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you should see a little chat icon. You can chat you can enter questions there at any time during the presentation. As soon as they come into your mind, you can put them in the chat and we'll monitor those. And at the end of the presentation, we'll, uh, uh, we'll ask the questions to Jack as many as he can handle. And uh, the other thing is we're going to be recording tonight's presentation so that we can uh, show it to the people who can't make it tonight. But I want to welcome you all. And I'd just like to say a couple things about Jack. I've known him for several years. I've known of him for probably 15, 20 years. He's a remarkable force in nature and education. And there are a couple of things that I really admire about him. Uh, not only is he a fabulous artist, um, but he also has a really holistic approach to nature, nature watching. And his, his, um, his passion is nature journaling, of course. That's what he's gonna be talking about tonight. But the value of nature journaling uh, is that it creates, it makes us all into better observers. It helps us remember things better. And I really, really appreciate that because I'm a, an instructor and I do draw as well. And I know how important it is to work on your visual memory and to create relationships with your subjects, to watch, to smell, to hear, to listen, to feel. The, the creatures and the life around you. And Jack does a remarkable job of communicating that in a holistic, um, emotional way. And uh, so that's something I really admire about him. He has several books I'm sure that you're aware of. I've got three of them here that I look at all the time. And um, I wouldn't be surprised if he teaches a few techniques tonight. So wouldn't be a bad idea to have a tablet and some drawing or painting utensils with you. I have my neutral grays here, my favorite colors. And um, he gives three workshops every week on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. There's an open forum on Tuesday. There's kind of a nature journal focused uh, presentation on Wednesdays and on Thursdays. It's a more formal conversation with a, a predetermined topic. You can get more information about his workshops and his technique and his life story on johnmuirlaws.com. And you can find out more about Audubon at scvas.org. So with that, I'm gonna hand the stick over to Jack, have him uh, take command of the presentation. And I'm really looking forward to it, Jack. So please, uh, I'm gonna hand over controls to you um, right now, um, if I can find your uh, if, if I speak, then uh, I might pop up more easily on the screen. There, I got it. Uh, change host. So you've got controls now. Uh, now, <laughs> happy to be your host. Hi there. I'm John Mirlaz, your host for the evening. It's good to see you all. Um, and um, it's good to see some uh, uh, some old friends uh, here on the, the screen with us. So thank you uh, for, for wherever you're tuning in for. Uh, in from um, whether you're uh, missing your dinner or had to get up in the middle of the night. Uh, Ray Bonto, uh, I'm really glad you're here joining us. Uh, so we've got a, um, tonight what I want to do is to share with you a few thoughts and ideas about how to, actually what I'm gonna do is I am going to um, spotlight this video. Hi, I'm big now on your screen. Check me out. Um, and what I what I want to do is to 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 try to uh, poke and prod you to start to keep a nature journal of your birding adventures. And you might at first be thinking like, "Hey, hold on a second. <clears throat> I'm I'm not an artist. I'm I'm not. I have not drawn since since fifth grade. 
And that's totally outside of my comfort zone. So I'm not asking you to be an artist. I'm asking you to start nature journaling. And the drawing pictures is a tool that we use in our, um, in our nature journals as, as part of the process. But the whole idea of what we're doing is, is not let's sit out in the forest and make pretty pictures. Sometimes you're going to get a pretty picture. And sometimes you don't. Um, and that's, 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 that's okay. But the process, the process is going to, it, I guess one of the most wonderful things about it is that it slows you down. It's going to slow you down and give you something kind of still to do that is going to again and again and again, focus your attention at something that you think you know. But the more that you do this, every time I sit down to, to draw a bird that I think I know, I go, oh my, oh, I'm, I'm learning something new. Because if you, um, if you go click and you take a picture of something, you go, oh, I've got it with however many megapixels. But if I'm stopping and I'm making a sketch of what I see, then I, I think I know how the, the line in the back looks. I put that down. But then I need to figure out like what, you know, how do these birds hold their head? And that, here's the big part of it, it makes me look back at the bird. And not just look back at the bird kind of like this. But I'm looking back at the bird like this, right? I'm really, I'm really looking for something. I'm, I'm intentionally focusing my intention. And, and I'm going to learn something new when I look back at that bird. I go like, oh, that's what's going on. So there's, there's constantly, when you are doing this process, there, there are going to be all these moments like, oh, I thought it was like, but I guess... You know, the answer is always there in the bird. And so you keep going back to the bird and the bird goes like, it's like this. And you go like, oh, okay. And then the bird says like, and this part is like this. And you go, oh, huh, that's different than I thought. Okay, but okay, we'll do that. And so it gets you just to, to slow down and look again and look again and look again. It's something you think, you know, the more you do this, the better and better your, your ability to observe becomes. And also you're going to find that your memory of this experience gets better and better. Human memories are really terrible things. Not just yours. It's everybody. It's the way this species is built. We have incredibly bad memories. And so uh, here's kind of a, a humbling thing. Um, within the first 20 minutes of you having listened to me tell you a whole bunch of interesting things, you're going to have forgotten about 40% of that. First 20 minutes. Right? And, and so part of what this is, is it's just acknowledging that that is the hardware that we're given. And, and so what I can do about that is I, actually, there are things I can do about it. And what it is, is I notice something. <clears throat> I download that information as quickly as possible to a piece of paper. And then I look back at the thing and I notice another thing and I download that to the paper too. The paper is long-term storage for your brain. And if you, if you think about this, you're already using this technique every day. Right, and, and it works really, really well for you, but you're not using it really in your birding. Because if you're in your kitchen and you run out of eggs, what do you do? Right, you write it down. You write down eggs on the list. Because if you're sitting around in your kitchen going like eggs, 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 cannot forget eggs, 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 Right? And they're thinking like, oh, what was I trying? There was something I was trying to remember. What was that? Right? So, and also when you're sitting there going, eggs, 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 can't for eggs, 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 eggs. You can't really do other stuff effectively. So if you write eggs down on the list, the next time at your store, you look at the list and it says eggs, you'd be like, oh, I'm gonna get eggs, and you go get eggs, and it works, right? So it works the same way with birds. Right. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna walk out into the woods. And you're going to have a little notebook or journal with you. And you're going to see something cool. You're going to put it down on a piece of paper. And then you're going to look back at it. And you're going to put that down, more information and more information and more information. And 
that piece of paper is going to hold that information. And here's the weird thing. If your journal at this point gets swallowed by a rhinoceros, you're actually much better off than you were in. It's not like, oh no, my journal is gone. But because you went through this process of really intense focus, much more of the details of this experience are now actually into your long-term memory because of the process of putting it in a journal. Right? You may have experienced this before, where you, if you've ever on a little trip kept a notebook and you're walking along, you go like, oh, look, there's this little abbey up on the hill and you make a little sketch of it. That moment becomes one out of all the rest in the trip that you remember. The process of journaling improves your memory. And you have this document that you can look at and kind of go like, oh, eggs, right? So um, it's not about making pretty pictures. As a matter of fact, it works best if it's not only pictures. So what, what I, I'm going to recommend that you do is you use three different languages. You're going to use words and pictures and numbers. So some drawings, some maps, some sketches, some diagrams. Those are your pictures. And you're also going to write about what you see. So the writing can be little notes and labels or writing things in paragraphs um, or description of part of the route, whatever it is that you are going to forget. Some things are easier to show with some words than they are with a, with a picture. And some things are easier to show with a picture than they are with words. And finally, the numbers are really great. The numbers are really important. So if you're out on a trip and you see this bird and this bird and this bird, you can write those bird names down. If you're already keeping a list, you're, you're most of the way there. And now you write in how many birds of each kind you saw. Your notes just became even more useful. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, <coughs> so um, let's take a look. Let's take a look at some of my notebooks and journals. And I'm going to kind of walk you through um, some adventures and, and observations. I'm going to show you part of the process, and then what we'll do is we'll, we'll kind of take, we'll kind of go out and and have a a, a fanc fantasy look around um, in the field, and I'll make a journal page uh, in front of you, um, imagining that we're finding birds together, and we'll kind of that will give you an idea of like oh I think I sometimes like seeing the flow, not just the finished project, but product, but the the flow of how it happens can help you get started on this. And um, my, my goal is not to give you all the skills that you could possibly have, all of my, my techniques. Um, I just want to get you, your curiosity peaked about this. And if it is peaked enough, then you can join me for, I've got all these free weekly workshops giving you more techniques and things like, next week I'm giving a free workshop on how to draw hawks in flight, all right? It'll be cool, you can be there. And um, then you can learn those things. But so I'm not going to be doing a super deep dive tonight on some really specific aspect of drawing, but you'll see these sort of big picture um, uh, general approaches. Oh, hold on. I'm going to just pause for a second because I'm noticing that there are some people in our waiting room and we're going to admit all of them. Hey, <clears throat> everybody who's just shown up in the waiting room, um, welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm going to disable the, wait, the waiting room so that nobody else gets locked out there. Um, and uh, hold on a second. And all right, let's take a look at some of my past journal pages. I'm going to jump over to this document camera next to me. Hello, document camera. All right, so I've got, I've got a bunch of different notebooks. And I need this to flip around. There we go. And so <clears throat> I am going to go into one of these. And these ones have, there's a lot of, of, of bird drawings in them, and and I'll we'll kind of take you on this little virtual adventure. Um, 
So this, uh, this I'm going to be taking a look at uh, some uh, notes from a visit to Rwanda. And what is fun about this kind of travel for me is that I will be encountering birds that I really don't know at all. And the, the, the thing that is, um, is, is really cool about this is that because I don't know them, it's really forcing me to not to make assumptions and to think I know it like, oh yeah, I think I can draw a, a robin from memory. But, but with these things, the white browed robin chat, it's got all of these little mysteries for me to, to figure out. So here's what happens. I look out in the backyard. And uh, so here we are, it's the backyard. And I see this beautiful robin sized bird bouncing around up there. So what I do is I start making a quick little sketch. And often the, the, the sketches are kind of light and, and loosely uh, done at the beginning. And if the bird moves, then I jump over and start drawing the bird from a different angle. I intentionally sometimes draw them further away sometimes medium, sometimes really close. So just doing these things at different sizes gets my brain kind of doing things that are a little bit different. So for instance, when I'm drawing them far away, you get the sense of like, oh, look, there are all these birds up on the wall and these ones are facing each other. And a little bit further away, I mean, a, a little bit closer, I can see the postures that they take when they are facing off against each other. So when they come up against each other, like here, this, these drawings are really showing me these postures and I get a sense of the distance between them. And as they're doing this, <clears throat> there are um, these sort of, um, this, this, this warbling that they're doing with screechy squeaks overlaid over the top of it. So this is my, these are my little notations of the noises that I'm hearing. And finally, when it gets really close here, in this drawing, I'm now kind of noodling in details of their plumage, like, oh, they've got these cool outer tail feathers that are orange and whatever little notes. At this range, I'm getting details of the plumage that I otherwise wouldn't see. So at each one of these ranges, I'm noticing different sorts of things. And you can see that by writing in, I get much more information about what I'm seeing than just having a drawing by itself. Let's jump around and just sort of see a few, <clears throat> a few more birds. All right, here's a little study of a kingfisher. They do some really cool, um, uh, there's some really cool kingfisher moments that I um, got to observe out by a tiny little lake in the, the middle of the capital. And here what you, you see that I'm doing is as I'm observing, I'm bouncing around from one drawing to another to another. As the bird moves, instead of waiting for it to come back to a position that I had started before, what I do is I just start a new drawing. And sometimes I don't finish those drawings. You see here, you see here, I haven't finished those drawings. But if the bird is really cooperative, I can get further along on it. Or if it was in this position before and it comes back to this pose, the drawings that I'm gonna get the furthest along on will be the most characteristic postures of that bird. So here is, you can see, here's some notes. Cyan crest can be raised up. Little drawing of that. Um, slightly raised crest here. Back looks blue or purple depending on the light. Then I'm wondering, how do they look in ultraviolet light? How do they look in UV? So part of my process here is to start to 
get myself to ask questions, to start to wonder about what I'm seeing. And those questions, when I get really curious about something, they drive me to look even more carefully. So this is a wonderful way to train myself to stick with a subject and to go deep instead of going like, oh, cool, Malachite Kingfisher, check, and on to the next thing. Lastly, I want you to note this really simple little uh, diagram of, of the lake where I was. And I've got little locations around it where I'm seeing these birds. I mean, just a little diagram like that can be really useful to convey a lot of information. Let's, um, let's jump to a different notebook. <clears throat> All right. Um, this is a, a little uh, trip down to Mexico. And what I want to point out to you is what happens if you make a mistake? And also um, how you can con convey a lot of information without um, kind of going nuts. So first, these are, let's zoom in on this, right? Check this out. So these are some drawings of black vultures in trees. And if you look at them, you wouldn't know that they are black vultures unless I told you these are black vultures. So how do you know that? Because over here, it says black vultures in palms, right? So now all of a sudden the blobs become black vultures. So you see how well the words work with those pictures, right? You see the words go, oh, they're black vultures. And then my, my, my picture can help me, you know, show that these things sort of weight down the palm fronds by sitting on them and how close they cluster together. All right. Here's another drawing of a bunch of black vultures out on the beach. And you notice that this isn't some really fancy, beautiful, detailed drawing. These far away ones are just dots with my pen. But this combined with these notes, all right, um, gives you a lot of information about what I'm seeing. So there are about 100 black vultures on the beach. Um, number one is the large group around a dead sea turtle. Number two is around the turtle's leg, and there's an unknown food item up here. So by making notes like this, I am able to record a lot of information. Again, the trick is words, pictures, and numbers all together. That's this wonderful triad. If you're more comfortable with pictures, you can start with the pictures and rely heavily on that. If you're more comfortable with words, right, then start in your happy place and build out from there. Well, let me show you what happens when mistakes happen. So I'm walking through the forest and this bad boy shows up. Oh, Man, I'm freaking out. How cool is this bird? It's so cool that I had to use my daughter's glitter glue around the edges of the bird. That's how cool this is, right? It's a bird that gets some glitter glue. Now, um, so I'm looking at this bird and I'm thinking like, oh my, this is, this is really, really incredible. And so I, I'm, I've never seen it before. And to the best of my ability, I am drawing what I see. But here's the thing about it. I made a bunch of mistakes. And at this point, I don't know it. And it's okay. So when you're drawing in the field, you're going to be making mistakes. And it's okay. You just keep on going. And it's, you don't, these aren't portraits for a, a, a field guide or something. These are your in the field notes of, of what you're seeing. And what's going to happen is, let's go to, ah, then a few days later, I bump into this bird again. And so now here is another sketch of the same thing. Let's compare this one with this one. So the amount of white in the tail, the proportions of black and white in the tail are different. 
And look at this little white stripe on the side of its face. How did I miss that? Well, I was busy. There was a lot of other stuff to see. And I was looking forward to my glitter glue. So um, I made some mistakes here, but now I'm incrementally closer to getting this bird. All right. And then I find another one with a little bit of a, an alternate face pattern. So this one here, all right, just had one white stripe. This one had a few little white commas going out behind its ear patch. And look at this. This was a mistake that was caught just the moment that I was drawing. I see it landing and it fans its tail and I notice that there are cool black and white patterns in the tail. And so I've got a drawing here with dark around the outside edges of the tail. And then I see it fly again and I realize, oh, wait a minute. The white is on the outside, the black is on the inside. So this is the mirror image of what I saw. But in the moment when the bird was landing, I said like, oh, black and white on the tail, there's edging. And I drew it reversed. And then I get to see it again and I'm able to go like, oh, I made a mistake. So what I do is I just write like, no, it's not this way, it's this way over here. So making mistakes, giving yourself permission to make lots of mistakes and look for those and welcome those. Each mistake is a chance to incrementally correct and change my understanding of this bird. And then a few days later, I bump into my bird friend again. And this time I'm getting little white patterns in this chest area, all right? So, and um, the colors of the, the, the back have changed. So from, a, it's, I'm now actually seeing it in better light. I'm seeing it as a light color, lighter colored back. So you see how, as I'm spending more time finding these birds, I'm slowly getting towards a better understanding of what this bird is like. And that's a wonderful learning experience. But if I were afraid of making a mistake, I would never put the first mark down on the page. So part of what I want to do is give all of you permission to make lots of mistakes. Make lots of mistakes. And if you do that, you're giving yourself permission to learn from them. But if you don't put them down on paper, you will still be making mistakes. You'll just never know it. Right? So a lot of our observation, a lot of the stuff that we see is, is just wrong. Our brain can't hold that much information and our memory of it is really sloppy. But if I put it down in, on the book, I give my myself a chance to learn from my mistakes. And that is part of the process that makes nature journaling so wonderful. It's a chance for me to observe and document, a chance to ask questions. It's a chance for me to um, also kind of notice what I'm noticing by getting more of that information down on a piece of paper, I get so much more out of that walk among the birds that otherwise would have been like, oh, it was a nice time out birding. But because I did this, my memories of the experience are really rich and vivid. So let's take a look at how this might look. All right, um, you, get away from the crowds, and you decide, you know what, I'm going to go for a little walk. Um, and you are, uh, you're not in any exotic, exotic locale, and you're walking along the trail, and you look up and you're like, oh, cool, there's a scrub jay. Now, <clears throat> one way of kind of getting yourself started with your journal page is when you look at something like this, it's intimidating, right? It's a big blank piece of paper. So um, one way of getting over that is um, 
I'm just going to, on that piece of paper, I'm going to break it in. I'm going to write the date. Um, uh, this is Wavecrest. And I am, and that is uh, near Half Moon Bay. All right, I just write on the page where I am. And then I'm going to go a little bit further. I'm going to say this is September. Um, is this the 16th? Let's pretend it's the 16th. We're out there today. And I've just put the date and 3 p.m. All right. So what I've done is I've georeferenced and date stamped this page. Whatever I do from this point on is going to be data. If I just have a picture of a bird in the middle of the page, it's not data. But the minute I do this and I start with this, number one, it's going to be easier for me to get other things onto my page. And because it's no longer this blank page, and I think like, oh, well, I wrote that thing on the page anyway. Now I, you know, I guess I'd better do something. So it's one way of just kind of motivating yourself to put some stuff down on the page. Otherwise, you might spend an entire day tromping around in the field and you never get out your journal. So um, I do this at the start now. Let's say it is partly cloudy. Draw a little cloud here. I'm going to draw a sun peeking out. And I'm going to write in it's less smoky. So that's what we call the metadata. The metadata is the data behind the data. Whatever I put down on this page, it's going to be much more useful because I have this little information of what I've, I've, I've done. Now, you're hiking down the trail and you go, oh golly, there is a scrub jay. Now, if you're more comfortable with writing, you might start by writing. If you're more comfortable with drawing, you might start by drawing, but eventually you're going to be using all these things. All right. And so let's, start, I'm going to start this with a, a, a drawing. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start drawing it. And my goal is to learn something new and to reinforce to notice when something I think about it is correct, and then try to learn something new from it. So my general approach when I'm drawing a, a bird is I just sort of, I start with the angle of its back. So here's the, its head sticking up and it's the angle of its back. And I'm gonna put in a little ball here, roughly where its head goes, and it's looking around and if you uh, take some of my classes, I'll, I'll kind of give you um, kind of my, a step-by-step -step approach that I take for drawing, drawing birds, which I'm kind of following in here. And, but I'll kind of, I, in, in future classes, I can kind of go into more details of kind of how I go about drawing them. But here it is, and it's, 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 it's hanging out on this, this twig. So I start with kind of just a, a light, scratchy, general shape of this bird. Now, the bird, um, it's, it's being cooperative, so I'm going to be able to kind of get a little bit more information on it. And I'm going to start on its head. And what I often do, if you're ever out in the field with me, I'm constantly talking out loud. So I'll be looking at a bird and I'll be going, oh, wow, the beak is a little bit sort of coney shaped, kind of long cone sort of pointed um, in there. So I talk out loud whatever it is that I'm seeing. And these may be observations that I've made before, but especially if something surprises me, then I will definitely say that thing out, out loud. All right, so I might say like, wow, its ear patch is much bigger than, than I thought. So it's got a really large ear patch. That's kind of cool. Um, and the, the, the eyebrow doesn't go all the way to the front. Huh, 
got more blue on the forehead. That eyebrow is just more, a little bit further back. So anything that feels surprising to me, I will say those things out loud. Those are my kind of learning points for that day. And by saying them out loud, it's much easier for me then to get that detail into my journal. I can also add in written notes. Um, I can write short white um, eyebrow does not reach front. See, I'm writing that in because it's different than what I expected to see. I have an idea in my head of how this bird looks, but anything that is different about that, big. Gets, gets a note. Now I'm starting to work on the head and now, now it moves its head, it turns its head. And so I could go hum, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum, and wait for it to come back. But if I try to do that, somehow it can tell and it will never come back to that position, ever, right? So what I wanna do is outsmart the bird. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go like, oh, you just moved your head. All right, now I can see the front view of your head, thank you, it's checking me out, I'm still checking you out. And from the front, all right, I can see eyeballs on either side and then big blue and on your cheeks, it gets wider and um, so I'll just start a new little head right off on the side. Oh, now it moved back. So I, it, I can then just move back to my other drawing. When it moves back, I move with it. So when the bird moves, I move what I'm focusing on. And gray. So it's got a little bit of gray on its back. I like having a drawing first where I've kind of blocked in the basic shape with these, these blue lines here. Then I can come right over the top of that um, with my, uh, here I'm using a, a ballpoint pen today. Um, and that allows me um, a very short, very short primary projection. I would have drawn it bigger, but now the bird is saying like, nope, that idea you have in your head, here's some reality and it's different than the way that you think this bird should be. Gray flanks. Jirip. I just made a call and I went Jirip. right in the call. So I'll make up my own little, it's loud, it's harsh, and up slurred. So as I, oh, so I was really getting into this drawing here and the bird is now hopped down onto the ground. So I could wait for it to come back up here um, but what I'm going to do is I'm just going to abandon this drawing and I'm going to jump over and start looking at this guy on the ground. Um, so it's, it's bouncing around and, and um, what, I, what I notice is that it is... Um, Hold on a second. I need to make sure that I can see what you see on your screen. So um, it 
I'm going to start just with kind of a, 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 a scribble drawing. Here's the line of its back. It holds its head up really, really high when it's bouncing around on the ground. And so here's a little And so it's going bump, 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 and it bounces. It's got really long legs. So that is my just kind of quick, I'd sort of do a loose um, sort of posture general sketch of this thing with a light pencil. And that allows me to, to block in my basic shape. Once I've got that, I can then go over those, those, those basic lines and start to get in more information. and uh, it pecked at the ground. Pecked into the grass um, and um, didn't seem to, to get anything, did not seem to find anything. Right, so words, pictures, they work so well together. And if you boy, it's cool how high they can hold their necks up. So again, anything that is a surprise to me, anything that is different than if I had just been making that bird up, I am putting that down in my notes. Um, broken collar. So this, here it's got cool little leggings and um, I'm wondering now like what is it eating at this time of the year? So, um, you know, what is it eating? Right, I heard them like you know going after all the bird nests. So what was it doing when it was pecking at it and in the in the ground? So I'm writing my questions. All right, um, is it hard to find food for the J? Right. And now I'm going to draw this guy bouncing along. Here is sort of bounce. And it's got a bouncy a bouncing gate. Boing, boing. So the pictures don't have to be pretty pictures. The pictures just have to be useful pictures. Um, and the more you do pictures, the better and better your pictures will become. So a lot of people think that, um, you know, like if you, if you're not a drawer, all right, sorry, you're just out of luck. You're not a drawer. Well, it turns out that drawing is just a skill that you develop by doing it on a regular basis. So lots of people in the nature journal club have thought they couldn't draw. And what they did is they just, they started keeping a notebook 
of their observations and very quickly found that this was a skill that they could do. And the more you work at it, the better it gets. And so I want to encourage you to be brave and give that a try. Um, don't worry about having to make a, the, the drawing look right. Don't worry about having to, about making a mistake. But just start to use drawings as a tool to document and record what you see. And the more you do that, you're going to find that it gets, it gets better. And it takes about, you know, uh, it, with, within a year of just drawing on a regular basis, you're going to find that the, the things that you see, um, your drawings look like those. And it's really fun to see just how fast this, this skill develops. Again, not a gift. It's a skill that you develop just by doing it over time. So then <clears throat> a white-tailed kite flies over and the jay disappears into the bushes. And so you're thinking to yourself like, wow, that was interesting. You know, did that white-tailed kite just scare away my jay? And, um, or maybe they're black-shouldered kites now. I can't keep it straight. All right, and so, So there's a little kite flying along and there's my J on the ground. See, not a pretty picture, but you kind of get a sense of some size and it's, you know, here's the edge of the trail and here's a, the coyote bush, coyote bush. And this guy goes jamming into there. Um, when this dude flies over. Um, jumps into bushes. When um, a white-tailed kite flies over. I'm going to ask, do kites eat jays? I don't know. But that's actually kind of a cool question. What is the what is the size at which you don't need to worry about a kite? So I'm going to put a bigger question mark by that. That's kind of a cool thing. So now I'm looking over my page and I'm trying to think to myself, you know, of, of this stuff, right here are my, my notes. Um, what, what are my, my big kind of take homes for the day? Well, this, this part down here with the kite, I really thought that was interesting. So, what I do is I'll often put a little box around this just to kind of pop it out a little bit more and also kind of set it aside as, as its own little, own little event. Um, there's my big question. I'm going to color that in blue. And um, And 
and there we there we go. So that um, I've got still some available real estate on the page here, and I can use that for some written descriptions of other things that I'm seeing going on. I can also keep a list. I saw the white crowned sparrows. I saw the um, Western scrub jay, one of those, white-tailed kite. It was a really good day for white-tailed kites. There were three of those, right? And um, there was a um, California towhee, two of those. For some reason, I always find those guys in pairs. So what I'm doing is I am I'm quantifying what I see. Um, I am using words, pictures, um, numbers to describe my experiences. I'm asking questions um, and um, sort of making connections between, between what I see and my, what I understand about different sorts of things. This sort of a process of, of exploring things in your journal. Let me jump to, oh, didn't want that. I want this. Hi. Uh, <clears throat> the, so this, this sort of a process of kind of dynamically going out there, you don't know what you're going to get. And um, if, you, um, if you are intentionally, intentionally using this, this system to just, you know, you see something, you put it down on paper. You see something, you put it down on paper. Again, using whatever language, words, pictures, numbers, initially works best for you. But then knowing that if you in intentionally use some of these strategies, like let's say drawing is not in your comfort zone. Totally fine, totally fine. Just start to use it a little bit, maybe making maps or maybe kind of cartoon drawings showing how close the, the J was to the coyote bush, right? But you're starting to train yourself to think visually. That's what you do. Just push yourself a little bit outside of your comfort zone. And that's the sweet spot for your brain starting to go like, okay, we can do this, All right? And then you start doing it on a regular basis. Your brain will change its shape. You'll lay down new neurons around this activity of drawing what you see, and you're going to get this. Um, it's drawing's not a gift. And this process of keeping a nature journal is going to make you a better naturalist. With time, and, and, and work at this, you're going to be able to walk down those trails and you're gonna find that you cannot get bored anywhere because this process trains you to slow down and just spend a little bit more quality time with the little things, the little nuances that you had just always walked past. I love this system because it slows me down. It makes me look again. And another th last thing that I've noticed with it is that when I do this, it forces me to just be still. And when you're still, the impact of your presence gets smaller. You're stopping, you're making some written notes about something, you're kind of into your writing. You're going to look up and you realize that while you're doing that, the animals started to pop up around you. When you first walk out and that you start heading down that trail, it's like that scene in Bambi when man has come to the forest and all the animals are scattering and hiding, all right? They know we are the most lethal predator on the planet and often up to no good. So they duck and cover. But if you, are, you stop and you're still for a while, that bubble of disturbance that you brought out with you starts to shrink. And it shrinks down, getting closer and closer. And animals start to come out around the periphery of that bubble of disturbance. And so they start, you know, you're in the same place, but all of a sudden they're coming up and they're around you. And you're like, wow, look at you. You absolutely can do this. Um, and I am happy to be your coach. Um, and if you want to do it without me, you can do that too. But give it a try and see what happens. It will profoundly change the way you see 
the way you think and the way you remember as you go exploring in nature. So we've got a little time now for some questions. Um, if you have um, any questions about the process or other related things or tangents that are completely irrelevant to this, that's cool too. And um, what um, uh, I'm going to do is, um, um, Barry, I believe, has been monitoring the chat um, for, for questions. And um, he is going to uh, drop some of these questions on me. So Barry, I'd like to invite you to unmute yourself if you can, oh, but you can't. All right, I'm gonna ask everybody to, to stay muted unless you're Barry and I am going to, um, let's see here. Um, uh, and now, Barry, you should be able to unmute yourself. Okay, yes, thank you, Jack. Um, what an excellent presentation. It's really highly motivating. It makes me wanna go out and start drawing right away. But it's dark. That, that out is there. my goal. That's that's my. I got it. You know, um, that, that was my secret plan all along. Is I, I think this is. A, it's really really cool to get to to start to see this way, and yes. and it's, it's 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 accessible. It's not something that like. Well, if I were a drawer, I could do this, right? Um, right. You can right. do this, and if you start doing it, then you as you turn around one day and you go like, oh, I'm a drawer now. That's cool. I'm glad that happened. <laughs> right. Very cool. So I'm going to go through all the questions that are in the chat and I'll start with mine because I, I asked the first question, which is, do you generally do the coloring while you're in the field observing or do you do the coloring later on? Um, it, it depends. I like to do the coloring when I'm out there in the field. Um, the mm -hmm. easiest way mm -hmm. to start with color is to, um, is when you are, are out there, just bring a small set of colored pencils with you. And you can yeah, overlay yeah. colored pencils, and it's much easier than messing with watercolor. Um, down the line, um, you can um, down down the line, you can mess with watercolor or anything you you want to. But I recommend a little set of colored pencils. You're going to find that when you get home, you're thinking, "Now I'm going to fill out my notes." Right? Like you've mm -hmm. forgotten it all. Right. But as quickly as possible, I'll try to get that information down. Um, and there's so much to be said in, in color. So color is, right. it's, it's, it's fun. So I try to do that in the field. So I've got a small portable set of watercolors. Mm -hmm. And so I'll bring this with me. And then when I am out there in the field, I, I'll show, actually, I'll show you my whole kind of setup. I have a rag, which is an old sock that goes around my wrist. I have a brush with the water in the handle of the brush. Right? Very and cool. then this little kit. So as I'm painting along, when I want to change colors, I just give this brush a little squeeze and wipe it on this rag. And boom, I'm on to the next color. So it makes the logistics of doing watercolor in the field a little bit more manageable. But Very I do fast, have a yeah. Small set of colored pencils held together with a rubber band. Best way to go. Cool. Okay, cool. Uh, Marianne Robertson wanted to know: Do you use a camp stool in the field, and if so, what brand? Um. Sometimes I do. Um, I I. Sometimes I feel kind of creaky, and it's nice to to have a uh, a camp stool. The camp stool that I use, um, it it says on it that it's a prototype and it doesn't have a brand <laughs> name on it. But somehow my dad got that and he gave it to me. And I love it because it's got a three-legged stool that has a little backrest that you can flop up and, and you can lean against that a little bit, but it still is a very kind of lightweight thing. The less I have to bring, the better off I am. Um, because if I have to lug a bunch of gear, sometimes I start thinking to myself, well, yeah, I, I just, I don't want to be bothered with all that. If I have to bring the stool and then this and this and this and this and this, uh, your, your, your brain will rebel and you're just going to want to go light. So keep your kit light and simple. If um, the, um, and, and, and then, um, and, and then you're going to find that, that you'll be willing to bring it with you. 
Um, but right. sometimes they do use a camp stool. Um, unfortunately, I can't tell you the type. Okay. Uh, Ginger asks, how do you handle birds watching you, watching them? I think you talked about that a little bit with the, the bubble contracting. Uh, is there a point where you feel it's a good idea to stop being the paparazzi for them? Um, so birds have, this is what you're saying is especially, is less true of birds. It's much more true of mammals. You get near mammals and they're like watching you. <laughs> Right, and then they and so very quickly they they raise their heads and then they start changing their behavior, right? <laughs> and now, but birds are looking at you. They're like, <laughs> "Look, it's one of those landlocked primates." <laughs> right? right, what you got on this, right? And so the, the birds, because they can fly, what's neat is they'll just kind of hang out and do their bird thing. They'll look over and kind of go like, oh, <laughs> you again, fine, no problem. Um, and so they can go about their bird business and they can always fly away. So a lot of people think like, how, how do you draw birds? They fly away. But it's actually precisely yeah. because they can fly that they do stick around, which is awesome. Um, if I see that I am changing the behavior of any animal that I'm watching, I back off. Right? Yeah. So if I'm trying to get closer to some shorebirds and they start to put their heads up or geese are putting their heads up, then I, then I back back off. Right? Um, I want to kind of stay, I don't want my bubble to be in their face. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but you'll find that birds will be very forgiving, uh, much more so than mammals. Um, you you want to draw. And the other thing that works great is good optics, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I've got a little spotting scope of Vortex Razor that is lightweight, so I carry it with me everywhere. A big scope, I find, I start going like, that's ah, just too heavy to bring today. But the little Vortex Razor is just this tiny little scope and you can boom, set it up and then like bird is in your face and you're not in the bird's face. Yes. And so that works for them, it works for me. Cool, cool. Matthew asks, have you ever seen a bird or other animal that completely contradicted your assumptions? Something you thought you knew, but feel you didn't truly understand until after you drew it. Um, so repeat the question. This sounds fine. Have you ever seen a bird or other animal that completely, completely contradicted your assumptions? Something you thought you knew, but felt you didn't truly understand until after you drew it. Mm. Um, so I, I want to kind of riff on this idea because it's a beautiful idea about, you know, the, the drawing is a picture of your understanding of something. And mm -hmm. you may have this idea in your head, that's what you think you know, uh, but the answer is actually over there in the bird. And so you want to just constantly be going, bumping back to the bird and back to the bird and back to the bird. And you are incrementally challenging your assumptions and correcting your, your misconceptions about the bird. If you're not drawing it, you don't have to do that. So we tend not to. If you're not drawing it, what I find I tend to do when I'm walking around is like, like oh, I know what field marks to look at when I'm looking at this bird. And I'll look at those field marks and kind of pat myself on the back and go like, yes, they're still there, right? And then <laughs> you, you move on. But there's nothing that's changed about my mind. When you're sketching, um, you will be kind of doing something and the bird will be over there and you'll look down at my paper and I'll kind of like, you know, there's, there's a disconnect here. So you're putting down your marks on the paper and then when you look at the bird and it doesn't look like the bird, you go like, oh, there's something about my understanding that is just off, that is just off. Um, I've, I've had the, a, a, an experience of just having to kind of Real to, to the humbling experience of realizing that I don't know what's going on with this. Like looking at um, uh, herons and egrets um, with that, that neck thing. And, you know, like, like I, I guess it was really hit me. I was looking at, like, I, I, I was used to the great egret and the great blue heron, right? And I thought I knew their necks. And then I was looking at a green heron. And it just, like that thing on the front, it just looked, it looked dip, it looked, because I had this, I, I had crystallized this idea of what I think is going on. When I looked at the real bird, the real bird looked wrong. 
Like, like what's up with that? <laughs> yeah. And it's not that the bird is always right, right? So Rich Stallcup, Rich Stallcup said that when the bird and the book disagree, believe the bird, mm -hmm. right? And it's the, the same thing is true. Like when you're in your sketch and the bird disagree, the bird's always right, right? The bird bats last. And it's a chance for you to kind of like, oh, I really don't get how this bird's neck is, is going on. And then I like to geek out and I'll kind of go home and I will do searches for like x-ray of green heron, right? And you'll be surprised what you can get. There's so much crazy stuff and awful stuff on the web these days that you like, if you're looking for an x-ray of a green heron, chances are you can find one. And um, that's really, really amazing to have that access. But I wouldn't be asking that question if I didn't, um, if, I, if I weren't uh, journaling and sketching. Right, right. I don't know if that answered the question, but it, there's some other thoughts in there that were related to that. Um, Matthew gave a thumbs up, so I think you answered it. Uh, and I think some of the things you said in your talk also answered parts of that question too. Uh, he has another question or a comment. Matthew says, I have a memory tool I use and I'm curious if you think it's worthwhile. I look at birds that have strong patterns like avocets, magpies, kites, and try to record their pattern entirely from memory in a quick drawing. I find that being forced to recall from memory really tests my memory and hopefully makes it stronger as he goes back and practices his recollection. Yes, yes, no, th that, that, that's gold. That's absolute gold to do. <laughs> So they, I think there's, there's a tendency to think that you have to get things right in your journal, in your notebook. No, 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 <laughs> don't. You've got, you've got license to kill with all these drawings. And so the bird, boom, pops up. You just go, so often when the bird first pop up, I, I don't know how long it's going to be there. I'm like, ah, 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 ah. <laughs> and, and so what I want to do is I want to try to like sync my memory as best I can with it. So here's the trick that I do. I, while the bird is popped up, I start verbalizing all my observations. I'll be t saying out loud what I see with its, the, 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 the shape of its back or its plumage and, and what patterns are where. And so if you're, I'll, I'll just be like talking the bird. I'll be talking the bird. And also if you, you look at me, I'll often I'll be you know, looking through my, 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 my scope and, my, and I, sometimes you'll see me with my hand in the air and I'll do this sort of from the side so you can see that I'm kind of bringing my hand down and and I'm essentially patting the back of the bird. I pat the bird. And what I'm doing is kinesthetically getting a sense of the angle changes on the back of that bird. So that's kinesthetically mm -hmm. kind of getting this mm -hmm. into me. And then, then the bird, it's gone. So that happened a ton when I was in, in Mexico. These birds would, these little things would be popping up. And I'd be like, whoa! <laughs> and 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 I and I wouldn't know kind of quite how to handle that. So I would just I would I would I would talk the bird while the bird is there. And then um if sometimes it's really cooperative and I'll then just sort of stick around and like, yeah, I'm gonna perch on this branch for the next 45 minutes. You just knock yourself out, kiddo. And um but but sometimes whoop, they're back down into the undergrowth and be like, oh, that was amazing. And then I try to quickly get it down on paper. What I don't do, what I used to do is I would think I got to get this right. So I draw my best version of it in pencil. And then I would go back home and I would look the bird up in a field guide. And I would change my drawings, my field notes based on what I was seeing in the field guide because I'm thinking I got to make it look right. And so I was changing all these valuable live field notes for, you know, trying to make it look like this thing that I thought it was supposed to be. And then there's one day that changed all that, that when I decided, right, all right, from, from this point on, I'm just going to let errors be in my field guide and, and, and stick with what I see. And if that's wrong, that's okay. So here's, here's the story. I was a student on the UC Berkeley campus mm -hmm. and I'm walking to school and I look up in the tree and there's this bird with this bright yellow throat and a dark pattern on its face. And I go, oh my gosh, it's a yellow throat. <laughs> and 
I see Matthew Dodder's face um, on the thing, and, and it was like, like that, and then his face just went. This, this, yeah, the, 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 he, yeah. So, he's probably so, figured out what you saw already. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> I, I go like, oh, it's it's a yellow throat. So I draw and I sketch it there, and and then, and then I I get home and I'm like, okay, now I'm gonna like fix up my drawing. And I look down and my field guy's like, boy, did I get that wrong, right? I've got like this, <laughs> all these other spots and things in these wrong places. I just did that terribly. So I got out my eraser and I fixed it and I made it look oh, like no. a yellow wrote <laughs> and then next day walking past the same bush there's the same yellow rumped warbler in the bush and it's not a yellow throat at all it's a yellow rumped warbler and yes. and 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 so my notes were correct but I morphed them into this other thing because I thought that I was somehow for some reason supposed to like that it's supposed to you know, it's supposed to, to have everything right in it. And there wasn't room for making mistakes. So you better go check it and make it right. And then I realized like, you know what? You know, when you're out there in the field, mosquitoes are biting, you're just doing the best. You just go ahead, kiddo. You do your best with what you've got, right? And let it be what it is. And then you can compare that. And it's fun when you get like then a series of things and you kind of like, oh, actually I'm gonna move that little mark over there and move that mark over there, right? Um, I got to see a black-throated gray warbler uh, the weekend before last, and I was looking at that like, like, boy, is my mental model of the black-throated gray warbler <sighs> totally whacked, right? Interesting, right? And, um, but it's it's the the the, the drawing journaling is fun because it it it, it kind of takes that and it puts it in your face in a way that's not like it's just like oh, there's reality out here, and it's a chance to just sort of sink. <sighs> You know, incrementally, you're sinking your mental model closer towards reality. That's just like the way that science mm -hmm. works. So we, mm -hmm. we are constantly incrementally moving ourselves towards a better conceptual, theoretical understanding of what is going on in the world around us, but knowing that we will never get there exactly. Right. Um, that um, our theories remain theories that are there are best explanations we're trying to figure out the nature of the world by looking at the behavior of the world itself in mathematics they get to do a proof right because they make up the rules for the system but in science we don't get to do that we try to figure out the rules for the system by looking at the behavior of the system right and so, iterate iterate towards the exactly truth. so we iterate make, and make so, mistakes and then yeah so I'm, I'm now i'm now like like this is my big book of mistakes and i'm going to iterate Right. Excellent. And so you just you give yourself permission to make more mistakes. Um, a wonderful um, uh, math professor at Stanford and real pioneer in um, the understanding of what's called a growth mindset, um, which is sort of how our brains develop and we develop skills by work and effort and practice. Um, if, you know, if, if a student like does a test and they get a hundred percent, she'll look at them and say like, I'm so sorry, you didn't get a chance to learn anything there. <laughs> right? and now, I, I, I shared that story with, um, uh, my, my daughter, um, uh, uh, Amelia, uh, now nine years old. And the other day she came to me and, uh, I said, how are you doing, honey? She said, well, we did this, this test today. And I said, uh, how, how did that go? And she said, um, I don't think I got to learn anything. <laughs> <laughs> Smart kid. Awesome. Yeah. So there's a couple more questions. Um, there's also uh, lots of compliments and comments that uh, you should be able to see the chat, or I can get the chat to you. Oh yeah, I, uh, I can later. Save the chat. I'll save the chat. And, uh, um, but w one of the one of the things that people were putting were useful websites, and I'm hoping we can collect a list of the useful oh, websites. Yeah. And we'll this video is going to be posted up on the Audubon YouTube uh, web channel, and we'll put comments down below and put some of these links in that section down below and links to your website and to your classes and other things like right, that. Right. Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, tell you um, two, two I, I saw somebody throw those into the chat, but the two mm -hmm. sites that I go to for um, bird photo reference, um, I, I, let, I really respect the work of, of um, photographers and um, they're very useful in me understanding getting better at my birds. Some people don't like artists using their stuff. They feel that it's somehow, if there's somebody who's copying from their stuff, that they, they don't want that. Mm -hmm. that's, that's cool. 
that's that's fine. Um, we can look but not touch. Um, okay. But um, uh, Vivek Kanzori and mm -hmm. um, Ashok Kosla, um, yes. two bird photographers, wonderful two folks. local bird photographers, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. They both have websites. So uh, Vivek's is uh, birdpixel. Mm -hmm. dot com and um, seeing birds as a shokes and um, wonderfully curated high quality photographs and so I use those for things in a lot of my classes and reference and you know I'll you know sit down with some of those one great bird pictures uh, when I was drawing the J I was over here on on bird pixel you're like like how does he remember all those details of that bird because <laughs> bird pixel open right and, yes well that um, that segues to one of the questions is now I've lost it because there's lots more stuff here, but do you recommend practicing from photo references? How is that process different from live drawing? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, ab absolutely. Um, practicing for photographs is, is wonderful. It is, but it's a tool in your repertoire. You want to draw from life. You want to draw from memory. You want to draw from reference photos. You want to draw from skeletons. You want to draw from study, study skins. You want each one of those will take your brain in a totally different way. Um, and you know, if you want to kind of look at the impact of never drawing from a photograph, all you have to do is look at Audubon. Mm -hmm. Birds with perfect plumage in wacky positions. <laughs> right? And <laughs> You're like, wow. Because um, we're dead. <laughs> I, yeah, yeah, because he, he just killed all these birds and he'd wire them up. You know, at one point, somebody gave him this beautiful live golden eagle as a present and he wanted to draw it. That didn't end up well for that golden eagle, <laughs> right? And um, so the, um, it, it is different than drawing from life. Um, and if you only draw from photographs, you can look at people's stuff and they're a very well rendered bird and they look like you drew them from photographs. But when you study the birds and you watch them in the field and you're drawing and, and sketching them there, you are, um, you're understanding kinesthetically, three dimensionally how these birds move. You look at Matthew Dodder's stuff, his birds, their bodies sort of fit into themselves, just like David Sibley's. And that's because these guys have spent a lot of time looking hard at live birds in the field. Yes, yes. And um, if you're just doing it from photographs, your drawings look like photographs. Um, mm -hmm. But it takes it to the next level when you are, so drawing from life helps your, you actually be able to draw from photographs. Because then you can like okay. take parts of things yeah, and be able yeah. to put, synthesize those together in a way that makes more sense. Um, your brain gets also better at separating big picture key details from the chaff of irrelevant distractions. Um, and the photograph gives equal, ef uh, equal emphasis to everything, right? Um, mm -hmm. From the, the key structural um, part of what you're seeing to the thing that's just a, a distraction. Um, so you, you want to you want to work from all of those things. Like, but if you like, you know, if you're little, something like, you want to learn how to draw bird feet. And so you spend a lot of time running around in the field trying to look at bird feet. <laughs> you're going to go nuts. But you, you, you go, you look at some photographs, you're like, oh, that's what bird feet do? Well, golly, <laughs> I can get a handle on these bird feet. Right? So uh, the drawing from <laughs> photographs, it's, it's not cheating, but just notice that it's different, right? And, and you can learn lots of useful stuff from it. And then, um, and so I would say instead of this or that, it is, I would say yes and. All right, the big thing is just sort of yes and. Um, photographs, yes. From dead birds, yes. From live yeah. birds in the field, yes. From memory, yes, 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 yes. Okay, quick question. Somebody asked, your glasses, your breakaway glasses, those look like they're really useful. Uh, what brand are they? Um, these are, they're called uh, click readers. And they've got a little <laughs> magnet um, in them. 
And so you never lose them. And when you're out, you know, birding and you're like, you're everywhere, like, where are my glasses? These things just don't get lost. And um, so they're, they're great. And they're just, they're just cheap readers. Um, I got these at, at um, uh, Coal Valley Hardware in San Francisco. Um, they got a little rack there, a little spin and rack, or there, or you can just type into CLIC. Um, uh, I think it's CLIC. I would take these off and take a look at it, but um, then I'd have my glasses off and I couldn't read it. <laughs> Maybe if I get really close enough, it's, it's, it's written on the lens here. Okay. Well, take a close-up photo and, and email it to us and then we can... Uh... Uh, I'm sure I'm missing a couple more questions. Uh, we'll do just one last one here. Do you have tips on how to automatically draw birds bigger? When I see birds in my backyard or on a power line, I tend to draw them small as they appear to me from a distance. That's a good question. Yeah, um, so I would say um, when you're, there's, there's, drawing things small is great, but sometimes when we are doing everything small, it's hard to get a lot of information into that small that small space. So um, I'm going to jump over to the um, thrill cam here for just a second again. Um, so um, what I will often do is I intentionally make some birds closer some birds middle range and some birds further away. So, um, and on, on, so on, uh, you know, you're out there and you're looking at, 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 a, at a warbler, um, you know, just to kind of get yourself to go wild, you know, throw in, just start doing a, a kind of a light kind of guide drawing of an enlargement of the bird's head. Right. And then you can put in, you know, whatever um, marks you, you want on that. You don't have to do the whole thing. But if I, if I start off and I'm doing a bird head this big, then by the time I you know, get around to drawing a full bird. Um, so you do something like you get, if you draw something like this size, you're gonna be able to get your field marks in there with some nuance and subtlety. And then, um, you know, try some things that are, you know, around life size. All right, and, and if you initially just block it in lightly, so you see how you can barely see these lines? That's good. So I just put it in with a light pencil. <clears throat> I use a light non-photo blue pencil. And then I've got kind of a scaffolding on which I can can do these these sorts of things, and then um, uh, so we'll just kind of give this bird a little bit more. A little more love and attention here. Um, because I started off with something bigger, it's going to help me do something a little bit smaller. Hmm. I, um, that, uh, or, and, and not kind of get, you know, you know, too, too micro. Um, so if you look through your journals, you're, you're probably going to find is whoever said that they, they're, 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 um, the, you'll see the same thing when you look through everybody's notebooks. There, there'll be one scale that they tend to like to work at. And 
So what you want to do is intentionally mix that up and um, so that drawing a bird at this scale is going to get me to think and notice in a way that's different than if I am drawing at a Yeah, it was a way too long a tail. Um, so if if I if I if I do stuff at intentionally, I'm going to pop my scale in. Just throw that in on the same page, and that's going to just help you mix it up. So I'm going to just jump over to the journals again, and we'll see about doing things different, uh, zoom out, out, All right? Um, so these birds are about life size. Um, here on this page, I've got jumbo and minis, right? Um, and notice how some of, the, some of these minis, it just sort of helps you know, kind of, I can get a kind of quick pose or what is the position of the, the how does the beak look when it's looking underneath the head, looking up. Um, all right, so here's zooming in, here's medium, here's further back, here's even further back. But these little quick ones here, those help me get, um, you know, behaviors. If I try to do something big, showing these little behaviors in interaction, I'm spending so much time drawing my picture that I can't kind of get the interactions. Um, here's this Annie, right? And it has, so there's a couple of, you know, in one side, then a couple of little sketches. So intentionally mix it up. Intentionally okay. mix it up. So here okay. is, Here's, this is all one bird, all these, some different sizes. Play with those. Um, over here, this is a cowbird and it's all one size. I think I might've seen more, um, mm. probably just by, by, by having everything the same size. Um, I, I missed some things that I could have, would have been really neat to otherwise have seen. Look at this, <laughs> like this little guy. Um, here's a backlit, little backlit um, green kingfisher. Oh, yes, yes. Okay, I, I think we should uh, wrap it up. There was one more question that I just noticed that I missed, and then Matthew was going to make a couple closing remarks. Uh, how do you juggle binoculars, journal, pencil, and camera in the field? Ah. All right, um, so camera is easy. Like a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah, um, so I, I, I don't have a camera. Mm -hmm. um, I, um, if I have a spotting scope with me, I can um, put that spotting scope over my shoulder and then you know it's gonna be self-supporting. But the big secret is how do you look through binoculars um, and at the same time be able to um, to, to, to sketch. So the secret is to, to, to stabilize your binoculars, you hold the, the binoculars like this, and then with your other hand, you hold your pencil, and then with your other hand, <laughs> your journal. And so just make sure you kind of take on your Shiva multi-armed form um, before you start sketching. Um, and, uh, and, and so like, you know, that, that's, oh, so, sorry. Um, but, 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 <laughs> Um, I'm with your feet. <laughs> of this. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll sit there on the, the ground or on my log and I'll pop up one knee. And what I do is I base my elbow on my knee and I've got lightweight Pentax Papilio binoculars. Um, so big heavy binoculars, you need both hands to stabilize this. But a lightweight pair of binoculars, you can stabilize that really well. I'll have my, my journal here on my lap, my pencil in my hand. So this hand is pencil. This hand, 
I hold my binoculars and I also will hold a finger or two against my face as I'm holding those. So that just makes the binoculars, you're not out here in wobble land. I stabilize it here, I stabilize this here, and then I can actually kind of keep my, my binoculars in the same place. I'll look down and sketch, and then go back up to my binoculars. I'll look through my binoculars. I'm saying out loud what I'm seeing. This and this stabilizes those binoculars. Look down and draw. So if I can pop a knee up, that makes this whole, I then get this triangle that makes the binoculars much more stable. And cool. that, works, that works really, really well. Um, also, if you're looking through a spotting scope, then you, that's also good for, you know, you can add one journal, uh, a hand holding your journal, the other one holding your palette um, or your, your paintbrush or whatever. Right. I'd say that'd be my approach. Okay. Very but again, cool. these well, are skills that we can do once COVID is over and this will be over. In the meantime, really just try to try to stay sane, be safe, don't get sick of it and go out and just play with your buddies again. It's really, really tempting to get out and get back into our groups because we're social primates. Right? Just just this will pass. It will pass. And when it does, I want to invite everybody out to join the Nature Journal Club. There are actually Nature Journal Clubs all over the country. We've got a really active one in the San Francisco Bay Area here, where we go out once a month with a whole bunch of other nature journalers. And you can watch everybody drawing and sketching together. We have a big potluck lunch. It's really, really fun. But it's neat to kind of, then you see everybody else's tricks and strategies and, and techniques. You realize that there's, there's no one way to do it. Um, right. And um, so in the meantime, you can join our Nature Journal Club Facebook page called The Nature Journal Club. Um, you can find that on Facebook. You can also find, um, I've got a bunch of free resources um, on my website to help you be able to, to do this. I also have free classes every week, three of them to help you do this different topic each class, boom. And uh, a lot of recorded videos of those. Um, and um, it's, it's fun, it's a learnable skill. And it will just, um, it's, it, it's a hoop, gotta get out there and do it. But in the meantime, let's stay safe. Let's keep our elders safe by, um, you know, keeping our masks on and um, social distancing. We can do this. You are not alone, we're still in a community and um, we're gonna take care of each other. This will pass. This will pass, and um, we will celebrate together again um, once we get a vaccine for this. Yes, we will. Wise words, Jack. Thank you. Uh, Matthew, do you want to unmute yourself and yeah. say a couple words? So, Jack, I just want to thank you again. That was truly inspiring, as I knew it would be. And there were a couple of things that you said that really struck home for me, and one was forcing you to slow down, to be a, to be a better observer, because I think actually we all kind of need to slow down and really enjoy and experience nature as opposed to just looking at it, checking it off of the list, getting a quick photograph and then moving on to the next thing. That's not really what naturalists are about. That's not what ornithologists are about. It's not what mammologists or herpetologists are about. Really the experience, the memory, the recollection, the joy of it is what I think you're talking about. And that could not be more personal for me. And what you're suggesting people do is share their personal experiences with themselves to help them remember what they've seen, help record it for themselves. And I also really appreciated how you said, it isn't really about art. You don't need to be a fantastic artist because this is a deeply personal thing. You don't have to share it with anybody if you don't want to. You're trying to share it with yourself. You're trying to live and remember more deeply. So I really, really love that. And I just, while you were talking, I happened to find one of my journals um, and I have pictures here of white pelican. And I made a mark on- you to, uh, um, uh, Just hold, hold that up again. I, I unfortunately had the spotlight on me. Oh yeah. So I, I, made, a, I made a mark on there that I, still remember like it was yesterday and this was 2011 
I said that the sunlight shines through the secondaries of the white pelican when it's flying overhead, and they gleam, as does the tail. So you're looking at the white bird up above you, and if you weren't really thinking too much, you weren't really truly remembering the experience, you might think it's all white, but it isn't. The secondary feathers glow, the tail glows. Other parts are pale gray or pale blue. And I also happen to notice that when it flies, it has what I call headlights, landing lights on the front edge of the wing. When it flies towards you, you can see these things. So those are the kinds of field marks that don't really end up in field guides. Those are the kinds of things that are deeply personal. And I remember that like it was yesterday because I made a note in my journal. And I strongly recommend keeping a, a journal. It doesn't have to be elaborate, but for just documentation of, of rare birds you see or interesting common birds you see. So it's all truly wonderful. And I really appreciate you making yourself available to share it with us. And everybody, it, I have a feeling a lot of people are already very familiar with your workshops, but if you aren't, be sure to sign up for one because they are truly wonderful. And Jack, I look forward to having you back soon to continue because I think you've just scratched the surface for me and other folks who haven't been in your workshops. And I just look so forward to having you back again so you can continue this amazing, uh, amazing passion with the rest of us. So thank you. Oh, Matthew, I'm, I'm just honored to, to be here among this community of people who love nature and stewards of nature. The work that you and Audubon are doing is really, really important. Um, it connects us with each other. It connects us with the world. And thank you for um, taking care of this chapter of the, the, the Audubon Society. So folks who are watching, if you are not currently a member, um, I encourage you to join the Audubon Society. Join the local chapter. Um, or if you want to join the Santa Clara Valley Audubon, do that even if you're not local. Um, really cool events going on. Um, but again, thank you so much for inviting me to, to spend some time with you today. Um, I, um, I absolutely agree with you. Nature journaling, it's not about making pretty pictures. It's not about art. It's about mindfulness and showing up for your life and how to get, it's a tool that lets you to step more deeply into the world um, and clear a lens of perception that otherwise would not be available to us. And um, right on. Yeah. Thank you. Word. <laughs> thank you so much, everybody. I just want to remind uh, you all that we do have speaker series almost every month of the year. Uh, this this uh, month, we've got two. We've got Richard Tejeda a week from tonight speaking about his very personal experience with Saved by Nature, uh, a nonprofit organization in urban San Jose. Uh, and we have uh, a, an increase in the number of artists and authors, researchers, and uh, world travelers, adventurers uh, over the course of the year. And I hope you check back in. They're brought to you free. Uh, but I do encourage you to become a member. Uh, Santa Clara Valley Audubon is a, a growing chapter. It's very active. And as soon as field trips are available, bring your nature journal and come along on one of our field trips and, and you'll be able to participate in those as soon as we're able to bring them back. So I'm going to say goodnight to everybody. Uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Barry. And look forward to seeing you in the field. Bring a pencil or some watercolors. Goodnight, everybody.